Secretary of State Antony Blinken arriving in Israel this morning to sit down with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in the Israeli War Cabinet. It comes as the U.S. is set to call for a U.N. Security Council vote on a ceasefire and hostage deal today. Joining us now is the former Trump National Security aide John Elliott. Uh, John, good morning to you. So Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has approved a plan to go into Rafah. The White House says they don't support it, so they want to speak to this Israeli dele delegation before they make any moves. So what happened? What happens next? Well, Carly, what happens next is that you have a Biden who's putting pressure on Netanyahu and telling him, micromanaging how he's conducting the war. And so, look, he has a specific task, which is to destroy Hamas, and they cannot live with any other outcome. And so here we are picking at how he's conducting it, saying, well, you can go into Rafah here, but you really have to have some humanitarian aid first and this and that. So, look, the whole thing here is just let Netanyahu run the war. That's the quickest way for this to get done. And that's ultimately the best way to relieve the humanitarian problem there, is to let the Israelis do their job on the ground yeah. and then and then at that point just uh, deal with the aid when we can later on. But he can't be hamstrung by the, this Biden administration. Well, when it comes to the war and the job that Israel is trying to do, there was a major development earlier this month. Israel killed its highest ranking, the highest ranking Hamas official since the war began. Uh, his name is Marwan Isa. He's Hamas's number three in command. So that leaves two people above him, Yahya Sinwar and Mahmoud uh, Mohammed Deef. So hypothetically speaking, if Israel is able to take out those two people in a targeted fashion, what would that mean? Could that be a big enough deal for that to end the war without Israel having to launch a full-scale invasion into Rafah? Well, it's hard to tell because this is like a snake. When you cut, when you cut off one head, then another snake appears later on. So yeah. this is a problem. Of course, that would be really important for them to target these two top officials that are remaining. But if still, if you take them out, there still could be on the ground. You could have sub commanders, lieutenants, captains, if you will, in the company sense, in a military company sense. But bottom line is that we can look to take out the the top. But that's not necessarily going to going to cure the problem because what happens here is that you have all these tunnels, you've got all these forces that may not even waiting for direction from their top two officers. So take them out, but then there's they've got to finish the job and they've got to go into the tunnels and take out the actual fighters at the ground level, or this thing is never going to going to be ended. So, John, there's this report from a, a government watchdog group that found that aid money going to Afghanistan through the U.N., most of that, of course, is U.S. taxpayer dollars. Some of it is going to humanitarian causes, but a lot of it is making its way into the Afghanistan Central Bank, which is run by the Taliban. So that means that U.S. taxpayer dollars, our hard-earned money, is now being used to support a terrorist organization. The State Department re released a statement, said that this is unacceptable, but there Nowhere in that statement was there any announcement of a plan on how to stop this. Absolutely, Carly. If you take a step back, Biden, this is something that we had with his weakness in coming out of Afghanistan. This is something he never held anybody accountable. Nobody in the DOD, not Lloyd Austin, not Jake Sullivan. So he had no accountability for that botched exit. And so this is another example of our weakness here, is that we are actually funding the Taliban through their central bank. As you point out, $2.5 billion, and that's out of 2.9 total that the U.N. is spending. So we're, we're doing about 95 percent of the funding. And because the Taliban controls the central bank, it's all going to the Taliban. Absolute disaster. This starts with accountability. And it's time for people to wake up at the White House and hold people accountable for this flowing of money right into this terrorist group. So U.S. officials have said that since we withdrew from Afghanistan, ISIS-K uh, has become the strongest organization, the most dangerous terror group in the region. And now we're in a position where we have to oversee that threat using the over-the-horizon approach. So where does that leave us? Well, it leaves us in an incredibly weak position. And once again, if you go back to this botched exit of Afghanistan, there would be what Trump had set up when we were at the National Security Council supporting him is a very good transition over to a divided government where you would actually have the Afghanis 
not give everything over to the Taliban, but that completely collapsed within about four or five months after Biden took office. And then he gave away Bagram Air Force Base. So now we only have to do, to your point, that over the horizon strike of ISIS, instead of having Bagram as a base there where you're going to have a limited number of U.S. forces. Now, you know who controls Bagram Air Force right. Base? It's the Chinese. Unbelievable. Yeah. So many players and uh, all of it concerning. John, thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm Steve Ducey. I'm Brian Kilney. And I'm Ainsley Earhart. And click here to subscribe to the Fox News YouTube page to catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis.